Redeemed now I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. redeemed. His child and forever I child and forever I am. The Church of Christ in Canada welcomes you to Key to the Kingdom. Today's lesson is entitled, The Death of Herod Agrippa. Thank you for joining us today on Key to the Kingdom. We're very pleased today to be filming this program at the church building of the Bayview Avenue Church of Christ in Toronto. Their building is located at 1708 Bayview Avenue. That's one block south of Eglinton. They would invite you to come and join them in worship and Bible study. They have Bible classes at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings and worship at 11 a.m. And then midweek on Wednesday, they have Bible study at 7 p.m. You can call them for information at 416-489-7405. Again, we appreciate the opportunity to use their building and invite you, if you're in the area, to come and visit with the brethren at Bayview Avenue and worship with them. If you've been studying with us in the book of Acts, as we have been doing over the last several weeks, uh, last week we were in chapter 12, in fact had talked about the beginning of the persecution by Herod Agrippa, uh, which begins in chapter 12, verse 1, uh, when we find uh, Herod having James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Uh, this pleased the people. <laughs> it pleased those who were in, in opposition to the preaching of the gospel. And as a result of that, uh, he brought more persecution, Herod did, and put Peter in prison. And we talked last time about how uh, the Lord delivered Peter from prison. And uh, it was a pretty astonishing thing because Peter was, was in prison. He was in bonds. And yet an angel came and brought him out of the prison uh, left all the doors locked and everything, brought him out of the prison and sent him back to the brethren who were at that time gathered praying for him. Uh, it, it's interesting that when Peter gets there, uh, they can hardly believe it. They can hardly believe that he's there, even though they've been praying for his deliverance, I'm sure. Uh, they're still very surprised. What well, if you think they were surprised? Imagine what Herod thought the next morning when he sins to have Peter brought to him, and he's gone. I mean, he's gone. They're just not there. And uh, so Herod doesn't take it very well. <laughs> uh, he's not very happy about all of this. Sadly, in fact, uh, those who were guarding Peter uh, were put to death. Let's go to Acts chapter 12. Verse 18, beginning. In the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. So here we see the terrible result for those who were guarding Peter. Uh, when Herod, who had the power, who had the, uh, the, the authority to have them put to death because they had failed in their duties, still tells us something, doesn't it, about the terribleness of anger. Um, you, you know, Herod, Herod was made to look a little foolish in all of this. 
And so in his anger, he has these guys put to death. Now, at this point then, our story continues. Let's go back to uh, Acts 12 and um, invite you, if you have a Bible at home, to uh, open with us and follow along. Uh, I'm reading from the New International Version when I read from Scripture. Uh, the New International is the most popular uh, translation these days in Canada, and so we've tried to use that, and hopefully you'll have one can follow with us uh, as we study. If we go to the latter part, part B of Acts chapter 12, verse 19, uh, let's look at that in verse 20. It says, Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. Well, here we have Herod setting off and going to Caesarea. Um, we're not really given much detail about it. Um, we understand and know that Caesarea was a pretty important city. It had a man-made harbor, was a place of commerce and so forth. So it was an important city. He goes there. And during all of this, we're told that he has a problem with the people of Tyre and Sidon. These were two cities of Phoenicia. Again, we're not given any details. We don't know exactly what the problem was. We don't know what, what was happening. We don't know why um, uh, Herod was, was angry with them or whatever. Uh, but they want peace. They, they want to work this out. So... So they call for um, a meeting. They want to get together with him to talk about it, to see if they can work out the problems. So this delegation comes and asks for peace, using Blastus, who was Herod's personal servant, as the go-between. He's going to, to be the guy who's going to help pave the way, perhaps. Well, let's go back to our text at verse 21. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. What a description. Here we have Herod in his robes sitting before the people. So much so that, and with such glory that the people say, this isn't, this isn't a man that's speaking, this is God, this is a God. Now the description by Luke is pretty graphic. At the same time, a historian of the time, Josephus, describes this event. He describes the appearance of Herod on this occasion when the king stood before these people in Caesarea. The occasion he describes, that is, that Josephus describes, seems to be very much like the description that Luke gives. His account of the death of Herod it's pretty graphic and fairly lengthy, but I thought I would read it uh, for you because I think it's interesting how, how it supports what Luke has written. Josephus said, After the completion of the third year of his reign over the whole of Judea, Agrippa came to the city of Caesarea, where he celebrated spectaculars in honor of Caesar. 
On the second day of the spectaculars, clad in a garment woven completely of silver so that its texture was indeed wondrous, he entered the theater at daybreak. There the silver, illuminated by the touch of the first rays of the sun, was wondrously radiant, and by its glitter inspired fear and awe in those who gazed intently upon it. Straightway his flatterers rose their voices from various directions, though hardly for his good, addressing him as a god. The king did not rebuke them, nor did he reject their flattery as impious. At once he felt a stab of pain in his heart. He was also gripped in his stomach by an ache that he felt everywhere at once, and that was intense from the start. Leaping up, he said to his friends, I, a God in your eyes, am now bidden to lay down my life, for fate brings immediate refutation of the lying words lately addressed to me. I, who was called immortal by you, am now under sentence of death, but I must accept my lot as God wills it. In fact, I have lived in no ordinary fashion, but in the grand style that has held, that is held as true bliss. Even as he was speaking these words, he was overcome by more intense pain. They hastened, therefore, to convey him to the palace, and the word flashed about to everyone that he was on the very verge of death. Exhausted after five straight days by the pain in his abdomen, he departed this life in the 54th year of his life and the seventh year of his reign. This was the description that Josephus wrote in his Antiquities about the death of Herod that day. It's interesting that both Luke and Josephus note that Herod did not rebuke the people for their flattery. And Luke says he did not give praise to God. Well, in, in both cases that's true because Josephus makes statement about the fact of his not recognizing or honoring who God really is. So both of these historians, if we want to call Luke a historian in this case, which he is because he's writing about the history of the beginning and the growth of the church, both of these historians record Herod's death as being the result of his presumption, that he presumed something. Now, it's interesting to me, as I read the account from Josephus in particular, is to, to think of when did Herod really come to grips with his sin and his presumption uh, and so forth. But, but we'll never know all of that. But we do know that God here showed his power with the death of Herod Agrippa. Luke's concise account gives us the physical cause of Agrippa's death as eaten by worms. Um, I, I'm interested sometimes when I'm doing research, uh, doing um, looking at, at uh, commentaries and dictionaries and this and that, uh, on various aspects of the scriptures. And it's interesting how people try to guess what kind of worms they were. <laughs> uh, I, I've always thought, I don't really know, and, and I don't really care much what they were exactly, except that they were worms that God sent, and they did the job. And he died, and a horrible death it was. On the positive side, a major persecutor of the church is gone with the death of Herod Agrippa. And so, while it's a tragedy in one sense, 
in another sense for the church, it was a blessing as they now at least have one less individual uh, to deal with who is so against them. Well, let's go back to the text in, uh, in uh, Acts 12, verse 24. But the Word of God continued to increase and spread. You know, persecution didn't stop the church from fulfilling the commission that the Lord had given them. You know, sometimes when we, when we talk about or think about the, the activity of service to God, you have to wonder sometimes if, if we would be better off, if we would draw closer to God, if we would be more respectful of God's laws and rules, if we would appreciate God more, if we were going through some persecution, if we were going through some difficulties to maintain our faith. The fact that we live in a country, and I'm thankful to God for the country that we live in, where we have religious freedom, where we can express our appreciation for God and to God. We can share Him with the world around us. We can do His work of evangelism, of ministry, of trying to help people along the way because of the influence of Jesus in our lives. And yet sometimes it seems we take a pretty lax attitude about our spiritual experience. It's always interesting to me that when, that when surveys are done, and people are asked if they believe in God. There's usually a good number of people who say, yes, oh, absolutely, they believe in God. But when they're asked if that belief in God makes a real difference in their life, the percentage goes way down. Because for a lot of people, it's simply an acknowledgement that there is God, that there, there must be a God. I mean, after all, you know, all of the creation and everything that's around us tells us there's a God. Remember Paul in Romans 1 tells us, you know, it's foolish not to believe in God. All you have to do is open your eyes and look around. But really the question is, does that, does that make a difference in our lives? The fact that God is and that we believe in Him and that we believe in His Son. Does he indeed live through us? I often say to the, to the church, and this isn't something I came up with, I heard it from somebody else, but I think it's good, that you and I are often the only Bible that some people ever see. In other words, people make decisions in, re in relationship to God, to belief in Him, to the importance of Christianity based on the fact that we are Christians and we live our lives before the people around us. Well, it's great that the church isn't held up by what happened, but they move on and carry on this great work that God has given them. Let's go back to the text to verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. So they return and they take John Mark with them. John, who's also known as Mark, we call him John Mark. Um, that's significant because it comes up later on. Uh, so if, if that's a new name to you, then just kind of file it away and we'll come back at a later time to see him. Now it says that Paul and Barnabas, or actually Barnabas and Saul, finished their mission. What was their mission? If you were studying with us before, you remember back in chapter 11 and verse 30, the church in Jerusalem was going through hard times and needed support. And the brethren... We're going to send this support. And they chose 
Barnabas and Saul to take this money. Well, they have gone to Jerusalem. They have delivered this gift from their brethren to help them with their need. And they have now finished that and are returning. In Acts 11, we were introduced to a congregation that God used to make things happen. That was the church at Antioch. The truth (laughs) expressed in humor is that some people make things happen. Others watch things happen. While still others (laughs) wonder what happened. You know, and, I, and I think that's true as we look at the work that was involved or that was done by churches. Let's go back to, to, to Acts 11 for a few minutes, starting at verse 19, because Antioch was a church that made things happen. Here it says, Now those who were scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus, to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now that's a particularly important passage, it seems to me, as we kind of zero in on on Saul and Barnabas, or as it's here, Barnabas and Saul. Remember that Saul was the guy who had been a persecutor of the church. And we read about his conversion when the Lord spoke to him on the road to Damascus, blinded him, as a matter of fact. And so for three days and nights, Paul went into Damascus and there spent time in prayer. What was he doing there? Well, remember, he wanted to know what to do. And the Lord said, you go into Damascus and it will be told you what you must do. Saul, who had been been right there from day one with the persecution that began with the death of Stephen, one who had been very active in persecuting the church, now finds himself face to face with the one he's persecuting. Because you see, you can't persecute the church without persecuting the Lord. That's what the Lord said, you're persecuting me. And so Saul became a Christian. When Ananias came, he received his sight, and Ananias said, arise and be baptized, wash away your sins. And Saul had done that. Now it's interesting that Barnabas here at this point, as he's working at Antioch, goes over and get Saul to come back. And the two of them work together for a year there in Antioch. And, uh, and, and that, again, is important because we're going to see these two guys' lives intertwined as the church grows and develops and, and new things start to take place. Now, the church at Antioch was committed to doing the will of God And they were seeking for fruit for the kingdom. They wanted to do whatever they could to take the gospel to the world. It's worth noting that when Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, 
they brought John Mark with them, who would later on become a very significant worker in the Lord's church. Uh, he also becomes, at one point in the life of Barnabas and Saul, a bit of a sore point and a point of controversy. But we'll come to that as we continue in our study. So we see the death of Herod Agrippa. One of the enemies is gone. We see the power of God as it is working on behalf of His people as He oversees certainly these things that are taking place. We see the church not giving up, not throwing in the towel because things have gotten hard. They just, you know, they, they've, just, they've just taken the bit in their teeth and away they go. They're continuing to work and to grow because they know the importance of their work. They know the importance of the message that the Lord has given to them to take to the world. They understand the importance of this saving message of Christ being taken to the world. And so we're going to see a, a new focus in our next lesson as we see the church moving on in fulfilling the work of God. And the Antioch congregation has an important part to play in that. Join us next week on Key to the Kingdom as we continue to look at this growth of the church. In Acts chapter 8, after the church scatters away from Jerusalem because of the persecution, Philip goes to the wilderness and meets the Ethiopian eunuch. He's riding along in his chariot, reading, He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. This is a passage about Jesus. But as Philip got up close to him, the eunuch asked Philip, verse 34, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? You know, one of the important things in studying the Bible is to understand who is being talked about and to whom the message is directed. We offer you a Bible course. It begins with an introductory lesson and follows with a number of booklets on various Bible subjects. We believe this will be helpful to you in understanding the message of the Bible, both what was meant then and what is meant now. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever I am. Redeemed, 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 redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, 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 redeemed. His child and forever I am. His child and forever I am.